Coming up next, Frank and Mary here in Framingham with your hosts, Grace O'Donnell and me, Art Bergeron. Our guest today, Dr. Karen Lyons. Stay tuned. Welcome to this episode of Frank and Mary in Framingham. I'm Grace O'Donnell, Director of Elder Services at the Callahan Center. And I'm Art Bergeron. Uh, my day job is as an elder law attorney at Myrick O'Connell up the street in Westboro. There are 70 of us at Myrick O'Connell, so everybody gets to do what they like. I like doing this. I like talking about to, talking to elders. But this isn't about my elder law job. It's about my friends Frank and Mary, who I often talk about in my elder law presentations. Their, life, their goal in life is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And if you can identify with that, that's the reason why you want, want to watch the show, to figure out the people you need to know and the programs you need to know about in order to stay in Framingham for the rest of your life. So the question is, who are those people? And my, my great co-host, Grace O'Donnell, inevitably finds these great people and has for the last few years. Grace, whom do we have today? Hi, Arthur. Our guest today is Karen Lyons, PhD and professor and gerontologist at Boston College's William F. Connell School of Nursing. She's an expert in living with chronic illness. And in today's program, you'll learn about an NIH study that conducted, she conducted together with her colleague, Christopher Lee, RN, PhD, about a support program to help couples living with and managing heart failure. A great topic. Yes. Doc great. No, that, you can talk anytime. <laughs> yeah. Doctor, thank you so much for coming on. It's really a treat. And tell yes, I'm delighted. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for having me and giving me the opportunity to talk about our study to your audience. Um, as you heard, my name is um, Karen Lines, and my colleague that Grace mentioned, Dr. Christopher Lee could not be here today, um, but we run this study together. And I do love to talk. I'm originally from Ireland. You may hear a little bit of my accent come out. I've been in the United States for over 20 years, though, and in Massachusetts for the last three and a half years. I thought maybe really you came it. from South Boston, doctor. You sound <laughs> a little bit like that some family members who've made it to South Boston over, <laughs> over the generations. So, so let me just, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, tell us who is eligible for this study. Yeah, so what we are doing in this study, this is an NIH-funded study um, on couples who are living with heart failure. And so that means we are looking for any couple where one of you has heart failure and the other is your partner. And so you can be at any stage of the trajectory in heart failure. You could be newly diagnosed. Even recently, we have people who have just been diagnosed all the way up to people who have been living with heart failure for several years. And so as long as you've been co-residing as partners or spouses for the last six months, you are eligible to be in the study as long as you do not have a heart transplant or a mechanical circulatory device. So a lot of our couples, um, the person with heart failure has a pacemaker and that's completely fine. We're not talking about pacemakers. So that's pretty common. And we also ask that you are currently experiencing symptoms. And this is probably the criteria that gets the most questions from our couples. So sometimes it's really hard with heart failure to distinguish the symptoms from just getting older um, and being tired. So we're looking for symptoms like shortness of breath, which is an obvious one, or pain. But we're also talking about fatigue or any type of tiredness that you may have after activities. And sometimes people think that that's not a symptom of heart failure, but it actually is. Other symptoms might include swelling. So sometimes your ankles may swell up after activity or after certain types of food. So it's a very broad kind of list of symptoms. So if somebody's out there is listening and thinking, well, I don't have shortness of breath, 
please still think about this study because our symptoms really are about the kinds of things that you may actually kind of decrease your activity because you get tired when you do something or because you're not able to maybe walk as far and that would count for this study. So, so I guess that answers the, the question that I had as you were explaining this. I get, so you're saying that you don't need to be a participant, you don't, you don't need a medical diagnosis. You don't need something from your doctor saying, this person you know, has, 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 ex is, exper has ex is experiencing heart failure. So I know when you originally said, well, heart failure, so does that mean like dead? Like, you know, you're just, you had heart failure, <laughs> you know, or, or is it mean you had a stroke, you know, do you had a, that you had, you know, you had some kind of stents or something, but you're saying it's, it's much more kind of nebulous than that. Right. Well, I think the symptoms are, right? So there's two criteria that we think about when we're recruiting for the study. One is that, yes, you have been told by a healthcare provider, usually your physician or doctor, that you have heart failure. And so that's different from just heart disease, right? So there's a lot of people who have heart disease in, and they may never get heart failure. Some of them might, some of them won't. But we have about six and a half million people in the United States who have heart failure. And it increases with age. So it dramatically increases over the age of 65. So heart failure really is when something has happened. Sometimes it's a heart attack. Sometimes it's other things that have happened where the heart muscle has been impacted and it's a little bit harder to get blood flow. And there are different types of heart failure. But yes, we're looking for people who've been told by a healthcare provider they have heart failure. But sometimes when someone has heart failure, they're receiving medication and treatment that is helping them control symptoms. And so sometimes they're thinking, well, I don't have shortness of breath anymore, or I'm not experiencing a lot of pain, but I do get tired and I don't exert myself in the same way. And so we don't want to discourage people who have heart failure and are doing well, but still might benefit from our study. So I, I hope that kind of makes sense and, and, and kind of removes some of that confusion. Sure. So it, it can be people who are early on in their diagnosis and potentially doing well. You're actually looking for the broad range of people, some people who are maybe experiencing some of the severe symptoms, as well as those who may be just in the very beginning of it. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, because the two programs that we're offering are really important at different phases of the study. So for people who really, this is still a very new experience, there's a lot of fear around this and uncertainty of how do I live well with heart failure? How do I manage these symptoms? The program can help educate about some of the lifestyle changes that you can do together as a couple and also how you can support one another and get some certainty. And then for couples who are further along, who maybe are in a different phase where maybe the heart failure is progressing and maybe are not sure how to continue or how to do things there, we're also addressing those concerns. So it really is something that couples are finding helpful at different phases of the trajectory. And that's why we don't wanna rule people out in terms of how long you've had it because there's benefits to finding out in the beginning, but also benefits if things are not going well further down the road for this program. Dr. Lyons, I was curious, why is it specifically for people who are part of a couple? Um, I'm, I'm interested in knowing what it is you're trying to determine in the study based on that rather than simply uh, studying individuals. Yeah, that's a great question. And we get asked it all the time. So I am what is called a family dyad researcher. And that means that I always study two people experiencing illness. This, this study is about couples, but we've also done studies where it's maybe a parent and an adult child. And so if you think about the statistics right now, we've got about 50 million, one in five US citizens who are caring for somebody. And if you think about people over the age of 50, we've got 42 million people providing care to either a partner, spouse, or some other family member, right? So this is, we're starting off with couples, but it doesn't mean that it, we will eventually expand to other types of family units who are experiencing heart failure. But it's a great question because the reason we don't want to just focus on the person with heart failure is most illnesses impact more than one person in a family. And when you're in a couple, it is almost impossible not to have both of those people impacted by illness, right? 
I mean, when you're in that kind of intimate relationship, you worry about the person, even if they're able to take care of their own symptoms, you're impacted by it because you're worried and you're not sure how to help. And maybe you're helping, but maybe it's not coming across as helpful. And so that's really a big part of what we're trying to do here is to bring both people to the table, because sometimes healthcare providers, they mean well, but they're really just focused on the patient and they'll talk about the patient. We don't use words like patient, right? Because people are more than patients. They're people. They're either fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, right? And so we're trying to keep the focus on a relationship that happens to be experiencing an illness like heart failure. And that's really the reason. We want to, we want to see this program benefit both people, not just the person who has heart failure, but their partner in life too. And that what? leads me to my, I'm sorry, Arthur, that leads me to my next question is, what is the benefit that people can expect to find from taking part in this study? It ranges widely. So some of the things that we have had feedback about is that they have learned a lot about heart failure. And sometimes, you know, when you're in a healthcare setting, it's hard to digest all the information and it gets a little overwhelming. So we can pace the information with somebody a little better. And so, for instance, in one of the programs, we focus a lot on how to get a healthier diet together. And so people can get some really tangible um, ideas and we give, you know, some worksheets and some things you can hang up in your kitchen. I even have them in my kitchen um, about how to reduce salt or how to get some more physical activity. And those are things you can do together, right? You both benefit from having a healthier diet. And a lot of times with older couples in particular, there's more than just heart failure in that couple. So we have, we have actually spouses and partners who have their own health needs, maybe diabetes or Parkinson's or something else. And then we also put some other things in there to kind of promote the relationship and just have people be able to safely share and figure out how to work together around their health needs. And are there other resources and family and friends? So feedback we've gotten from people is that we never really talked like this before. We never really shared our worries and concerns. And now we're making better decisions together or we feel more supported by one another. Um, and I think that makes our program pretty unique in terms of not just having maybe some more education and knowledge about how to do this, but also some strategies for how to do it better together and to be able to share. And so, you know, oftentimes when you have somebody in your relationship who has an illness like heart failure, you do have a lot of fear and worry, but you also have a lot of guilt about, I don't want to talk about myself because I'm supposed to be just focused on my, my um, husband or wife or partner. And so we, we, we create safe spaces to be able to talk about what is it that's really worrying people? What is it that people really want to do better at together? So there's a lot of focus on coming up with a shared goal. We don't tell couples what to do. We provide strategies that we have seen work for couples and they get to choose what they do. So this is not about changing you as a couple. And I know that that's a big fear sometimes for people where they say, I'm not going to be in a program like that because I, I don't want to be changed. And we are absolutely not in the business of changing people. We want to take all the strengths that you have as a couple and that you have had as a couple throughout your life together and help you get that back to be able to manage this experience and have a healthier, happier life. Arthur, you had something you wanted to say? No, I, that's, it's just, it's, it's. I, I will, as, as doctor, as you were speaking, you could see both from Grace and I, both of us kind of looking, I mean, we deal with this like all the time, right? Cause we deal with, we're dealing with nothing, practically nothing but seniors. And you're seeing so many se senior couples who are, who are, this is just playing out. And, and I do a lot of work, uh, you know, in, in, inevitably around people who have dementia. And that's kind of like the mantra is that the dementia is everybody's disease. It's the family's disease. It's not just your disease. Everybody's having to play off of it. But similarly, the family is the solution. You know, the family right. is, is suffering the disease, but the family is also the solution. So it's the, the notion of really uh, focusing on, and there's, as Grace was, was I think we were both doing this, you know, because because you, there's always that denial too. You don't, it, you're denying to each other. You don't, if you're, if you're, you don't want to, you don't want to be burdening the other person. Every, you know, so many couples goal is to not be burdening their spouse, you know? So I guess, with, I, but I, but so that said, I guess I had a, I had a, a follow-up question. Could you, could you, 
illustrate, and maybe it was Grace was going to ask this, but it, could you illustrate for us, for people who are participating, what participation means um, right. and, 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 and what you are anticipating as the metrics that you're looking at at the end of the day? What, 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 are, you, what are you trying to figure out? How do you know that you, what are you trying, broadly, what are you trying to accomplish through focusing this way and how are you measuring that and how are you doing that? Yeah, great questions. And I will say before I just answer that, that you know, I've done this for over 22 years now and um, heart failure is one context, but I, I did start in dementia and um, have also done Parkinson's and a lot in cancer too. And, and so I appreciate there are lots of health challenges that couples have to navigate and we forget sometimes they are their best resources. Um, so I completely agree with you about that. This particular study is actually comparing two programs. So that's also unusual. Sometimes when you sign up for a study, you get randomized to maybe the intervention, nothing, right? And we didn't want to do that. And um, we just, we really felt very strongly that everybody had to be helped. So we actually developed two programs. Both of them run for two months. One of them is a little bit more intense than the other. So we're trying to figure out how to proceed in a much, much bigger trial for lots of couples um, by, by getting some information from this one. So we know that both of them are supportive and help, but one of them has seven sessions over two months. So it's about one a week. And the other has just three. They're about 30 to 60 minutes in length. And they take place either by Zoom or by phone. So you get to choose. You don't have to travel anywhere. You're not in a room with all uh, a lot of other couples. It's just the two of you and your interventionist. So the scheduling is incredibly flexible. It's completely up to you. We do do weekends. We do do evenings for people who work and prefer that. And so what we do if you actually sign up for the study is we ask you to um, fill out a survey before you start, because what we're trying to do, because this is NIH funded, so that's federal money, that's taxpayer money, is we want to be able to say what worked about this and who liked each program, like what, so that we can tailor this down the road, right? So some people are finding it really helpful because it's lowering depression or it's reducing the strain that they feel or they feel more connected to each other. Um, some people are finding it helpful because they just feel they know more. They feel more empowered about it because they didn't really totally understand that all of those things were symptoms and that they could actually predict them. So we have some worksheets that try to help people to actually think about, wait, I feel tired after I do this. Maybe there's a pattern that I could, I could prepare for, maybe not have that symptom as much. We give some guidelines about how to talk to your healthcare provider. So some people really love that. So it's all very individualized in terms of the outcomes that people might find beneficial. What we are trying to say is what components of these two programs are working for people who are living with heart failure and what's not working? What do people not like about it? Is it too many sessions, not enough sessions um, and the content? And so the, the survey that we asked you at the beginning has some background information about your demographics so that we can, we can look at that. But then it also asks you about the symptoms that you're experiencing and your overall health. So not just the person with heart failure, but that partner or spouse too. We ask you a little bit about your anxiety and depression and how your relationship is um, and the family support that you have. We actually, because this study started in the pandemic, we also have a measure in there around the impact of COVID because that's been incredibly stressful for some people. And we want to make sure that we're capturing that too. And then we ask you the same questions after you complete the two month um, program, no matter which one it is. But then we add in a questions to um, give you a chance to tell us what you liked and didn't like about the program. And that's probably the most important outcome of the study um, is really what worked for you, what you liked about it, what you would change. Would you recommend it to a friend? Because the more information we get there from couples in terms of what they liked and didn't like, the better we can make these two programs so that we can actually distribute them in a much bigger way. I mean, obviously, our dream come true is to get enough evidence for clinical settings to pick up these programs or to make them widely and freely available in communities everywhere. 
um, and to maybe even get them into like web-based modules for people who want to do it like that. Um, so those are kind of the big goals. And those are the questions that we ask. Lots of health questions, um, a little bit about like just what it's like, the, the toll of like living with this, what's good about it. So we ask you, you know, how well your relationship is going. But again, you can skip any question you like. You can leave anything blank. You're completely in charge. You can drop out of the study at any time. You can um, ask not to do parts of sessions if you don't like to. Um, but again, it really is trying to get a sense of what's helpful to couples because there is so little out there for people who are living with heart failure and so little that's really focused on, on anything really other than the medication and um, some simple things around symptom management. So this is taking a much broader picture of that. And so I hope that um, helps a little bit in, in kind of giving people that sense of what it's about. I will say, because it's very important and it does concern people, is that we do not ever say who gave us the data. So everything is anonymous. Once you sign the consent form, once the data comes in, everything is stripped off there that would ever identify you. So when we report back to NIH and when we publish these um, findings for the um, community at large, um, and when we put out newsletters, it's all for the average sample and it's all completely de-identified and anonymous. So your particular individual information will never be known to anyone. And when we look at the data, even I don't see names. I only see ID numbers. And that's really important for us to um, get out there for people to know that we hold your um, willingness to be in our study very, very highly. And we protect your information up mostly. All of our staff are really well trained. Um, and we've been doing this for a very long time. Uh, could I ask uh, Dr. Lyons, are there certain uh, ethnic groups that have more propensity for heart failure? And are you seeking to have a, a broad range of people to participate? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think we would just really love to have this be generalizable and representative of the people who do live with heart failure and do experience this. And so, yes, you're absolutely right in terms of it would be really great to have representation from the African-American community and Hispanic community in particular. We welcome absolutely anybody who wants to be in the study. You do not need to be married. You do not need to be heterosexual. So we are incredibly open and do not um, refuse anybody who is a partner or co-residing partner for the last six months. But yes, thank you for bringing that up because that is hugely important to us. We actually are advertising this nationally because we really are very, very committed to having diversity, but also representing the people who really do struggle with this illness. And, and, the, and the information that you gave regarding the metrics and regarding the, the, the way it works, I think is also helpful for people because you understand, first of all, it's like, what am I getting myself into? This isn't like the Framingham Heart Study, you know, and you're there for 30 years, you know. That's right. You're putting it right. This, this, is two, this is two months, right? And it's, you know, and, you know, and you're, and even in, 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 the, in the hardest case, it's like seven sessions or maybe it's three. Right. And it also doesn't, and it also, it was helpful to understand kind of the, met, the kind of the performance metrics, because you're not looking here to be saying, you know, at the end of the two months, you know, you're doing more push-ups or you're doing this or you're doing that. Right. It's really a matter of you're saying at the end of that period, you've looked at this package of things, which has really helped you in terms of figuring out what else to do, right? Which is a very, that's, that's, that's really helpful. That's really helpful. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great point. We are not, we're not going to come after you and say you're not doing anything. This is completely steered by you. If you don't want to try any strategy, you don't have to. Um, if you want to skip sessions, if you want to drop out early, you can. But we really appreciate you participating. And everyone who has gone through the program so far has found something helpful about the experience. And sometimes there's actually even a sadness that the program is ending because you really can develop this great relationship with the interventionist and have this time together as a couple to really strategize how you want to live with heart failure. Dr. Lyons, I'd like to make sure that we give you the opportunity to identify the phone number. 
that people can call to find out more about this or a website? Yes, thank you so much. Yes. So if you are interested in hearing more about it, you don't have to commit. We can just talk to you a little bit more about the ins and outs of the study, answer any questions that you might have. Our study phone number is 617-552-1830. And it's a Boston College study. So again, if you want to look into this and before you call, you are very entitled to call the Boston College IRB. It is registered with them. It is also registered at clinicaltrials.gov. So you can look for some background information there too. But the number again is 617 517- 552-1830. You are also very invited to email me directly if you want to. So if you prefer email, my email is Karen, K-A-R-E-N dot Lyons, L-Y-O-N-S at B-C dot E-D-U. So either one you can use. Some people don't like to be on the phone and that's fine. But if you prefer to just send uh, an email to me, I will get back to you and we will be happy to answer any questions you have about the study or participating. So it sounds to me like not only might people gain something for this that will help them, but they're actually helping you to develop a program that will help other people. And I think that's something a lot of people like the idea of contributing to something like that. Yes, Yes, and many of our couples have said that. So it is really just there's so many reasons for us. It's a privilege to have you in there. We do believe you will benefit from the program, but you're also really benefiting us in moving this program forward in a better way to many, many more people. And again, we would love to expand eventually beyond couples to other family units around heart failure um, as well. So yes. And, and once again, I won't remember this from the beginning, but there's no there's no minimum age to for people who to, to participate. It can be it, it, it just eight, needs to be a couple. Right? Yes, it needs to be a couple and an adult that you were diagnosed as an adult with heart failure, um, and that you are able to um, sign up for a two month study. So again, you don't have to start it immediately, but if you feel like you have commitments and you won't be able to be around for two months, or if you're in another study. Those are really, it's, it's very few restraints on who we're looking for. So Grace, thank, thank you so much. Grace, see, Grace always does this. Grace always finds these great people. So do, doctor, I think this has just been really helpful. And I think it can really, you know, for folks who, are, who you're watching, this is no stress. This is trying to help you out, figure out options. And by you're doing that, as Grace says, you're helping a lot of other people out because they're figuring out with the National Institutes of Health you know, how best to be helping couples figure out the fact that this that, that, you, that you as a couple are living through. So thank you so much, doctor. This has just been a real pleasure. Grace, thank you always. And we'll look, we'll look forward to folks watch seeing you on the next installment of Frank and Mary here in Framingham. Thank you very much.